Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Nanam Paramam Dheyam Knowledge is Supreme Welcome back. So uh, we'll try to finish uh, this first module on dyna process dynamics, uh, where we try to understand how a process responds to changes in inputs uh, by uh, looking at uh, how can we predict the response of any transfer function given uh, there is some step in the input. So we will try to see or I will try to give you some tools uh, in terms of predicting the response of any transfer function and this we will be doing uh, by finding out poles and zeros of that transfer function. So what we need is the transfer function, uh, we, once we have the transfer function uh, we should be able to predict its uh, step response by using these steps. So the first step, uh, uh, let us say this is for a transfer function of the form ns over ds. So the first step is uh, to find all the poles and zeros and the next step is you use the final value theorem and in certain cases initial value theorem as well. And with the help of these two, uh, we would be able to predict a uh, response, a uh, step response of any transfer function. So for that, uh, what we do is, uh, we try to plot these poles and zeros uh, into the complex plane. So this is the real axis, uh, this is the imaginary axis. And in this figure, uh, for any transfer function, we will plot or we will put uh, the poles as well as zeros. So we will start with poles, so let us say uh, the pole of the system falls at the origin. So this is our origin, let us say if the pole is at the origin. So when the pole of a system or a transfer function is at origin, uh, the denominator of the transfer function will have a term 1 over s or the denominator will have a term s. So when we have a step response, uh, it will be get multiplied by 1 over s. So we will have terms like s square when we look at the transfer Laplace of y s. So in such a case, when you have pole at origin, the transfer function will have s in the denominator. So when we talk about y s, it will have s square multiplied by something. So when we want to take ys in terms of partial fractions, in that case uh, we will be writing it as a over s plus b over s square and the other terms. So what we are going to have is b over s square, the inverse of that will give you bt. So even though uh, so this system will have will li increase linearly with time or the one of the dynamic modes of this system will increase linearly with time. So whenever you have pole at origin, it will be an unstable system. Or grows linearly with time. So it will not have a stable final value. So that is the case when you have pole at the origin. When we have pole on the real axis, any pole on this real axis in the left half plane, so with a negative value, what we are going to have is the response will have e raised to minus 
some lambda t terms which all will decay down to 0. So, all these will give you stable response to so stable or finite response over damped response. There will be no oscillations in such a case. The oscillations will come if the poles or the there are complex conjugate poles. So, if you have any pole in this quadrant or this quadrant again still in lower left half plane what you will get are decaying oscillations. These terms will give you e raise to power a plus b i. So, there will be e raise to a t and e raise to b i t. So, that first term will give you the magnitude of oscillation and the second term will give you sines and cosines. So, as the magnitude is on the negative side uh, the, uh, the oscillations will decay, but there will be oscillations when you have the poles on the left half plane, but not on the axis or the real axis. Exactly opposite case uh, would be when we talk about the right half plane. So, this is the case when all the poles are on the left half plane. Now, if any pole is on the right half plane, if it is on the axis, it will be e raise to power some positive number times t. So, the response will just grow in time. So, the response will be infinite when time goes to infinity. So, all these would give you unstable or infinite response. This happens when any of the pole is on this side, even though n minus 1 poles are on the left half plane, even a single pole on the right half plane will give you these kind of responses because all these will die down to 0 as time t goes to infinity. So, the only thing which does not die down to 0 will be anything on the right half plane. Similarly, if we have some complex conjugate poles, these will give you oscillations, but these will be growing oscillations. So, the oscillation magnitude will keep on growing as a function of time and again it you will get infinite response as time t goes to infinity. So, if any pole or any pair of poles is on the right half plane, you will have such infinite or <coughs> growing responses. Uh, the last case which is remaining in this is if your poles are complex conjugate but or with real part which is 0 or purely imaginary poles. So, in that case uh, what you will get are sustained oscillations. Which is also known as marginally stable process. So, depending on where your poles of the process lie, uh, you may have an overdamped response stable and finite, you may have decaying oscillations, you may have growing oscillations, you may have an unstable or infinite response or you may have sustained oscillations into your system and lastly you may have an integrator which increases linearly as a function of time. So, depending on uh, the values of poles for a system, the overall dynamic modes of the process can be calculated by simply looking at uh, the poles. Then next comes are the zeros. See if I want to summarize this, what you would get is, so pole at origin gives you integrator. pole real and negative will give you overdamped response. Complex with negative real part will give you decaying oscillation. And then the opposite uh, side of that uh, would be real and positive, so infinite response, complex with positive real part will give you growing oscillation.
and then purely imaginary pole will give you sustained oscillation so so far we have uh, not looked at uh, where the zeros of the system are so we'll now see uh, how this analysis changes uh, when we have zeros into the system as well so when uh, you have zero into the system or zero at origin Uh, the transfer function will be of the form s in the numerator so whenever you try to find out the final value by the final value theorem it will be limit s tending to 0 s of ys is equal to limit s tending to 0 s times step response so it will be limit s tending to 0 a times g of s and as 0 is at origin g of 0 is 0 so the final value of the response will be 0 so whenever there is a 0 at origin the response decays to 0 so the final value of the output will always be equal to 0 whenever there is a 0 at the origin so uh, if we go back to this figure so if i say there is a 0 at origin then it will give me response goes to 0 now for most of the parts uh, zero would just change the relative contribution uh, which would not be uh, directly predictable uh, the only case when you can predict uh, the response of a zero so let us try to use a different figure for zero so this is real part this is imaginary part so if there was a zero at the origin the response decays to zero now if the zero is on the real negative real axis and it is closer than any of the poles so this zero is on the real negative real axis and it is closer than any of the poles to the origin in that case you will get overshoot without oscillations obviously so this was the case uh, when we had overshoot into that first order or second order system this is the type of zero which is the to origin than any of the poles those cases will give you overshoot and the other case uh, which is going to give you interesting results is if the zero is on the right half plane so if the zero is a real zero on a right half plane it is going to give you inverse response so by uh, putting the zero also into the uh, into the complex plane uh, you can predict whether there will be an overshoot without oscillation or whether there will be an inverse response this will be on top of the way we predicted the response for the poles and the combined response will be the combination of these two factors and then lastly uh, something which you should also keep in mind while predicting the response is the initial slope of response so that is dy by dt at t equal to 0 so that depends on the difference write it the other way around 
degree of the denominator polynomial minus the degree of the numerator polynomial of this difference is greater than 1 then the initial slope will be equal to 0. That was the case uh, when we had a pure second order or a pure higher order system. In that case the denominator polynomial degree was greater than the numerator by 1 uh, more than 1. So, in that case the response does not start immediately the response has a 0 slope at time t equal to 0. When the difference is equal to 1 then the slope is finite the slope is not equal to 0 the response immediately starts and if this difference is equal to 0 in that case dy by dt is not defined and there is a discontinuity in y. So, this was the case uh, when we have the lead lag type of dynamics. This was the case of the first order dynamics and this is the case when you have second or higher order dynamics. So, by knowing the initial slope or how the response starts uh, then looking at whether you have overshoot or inverse response and then also combining it with whether you have stable response, overdamped response, growing uh, decaying oscillations, growing oscillations all that in combination you would be able to predict response of any transfer function for a step change. So, to summarize uh, what we have seen is uh, the poles of the system or transfer function will give you what are the dominant modes of that particular dynamic uh, transfer function. The zeros will give you the relative contribution and will also give you some conditions when you can get overshoot or inverse response. And then these values of poles and zeros uh, would be able will help you to predict response of any dynamical system. So, at this point uh, we have finished. Uh, uh, and analyzing how dynamical systems behave. So, uh, in terms of in the context of this course on process control what we have seen is given a change in the input how the system responds. So, now we have a better understanding of the process once we now we are now at a position that uh, we know how the system is going to behave. So, now we can have a way to control the process. Now we are at the stage where we, we know how the system behaves. So, we know exactly how uh, in order to move the process from one point to the other how we should change the input of the process. So, it is more like an in solving an inverse problem. So, as we know the way process behaves uh, we should be able to now tame its behavior or move the or behave make the process behave the way we want. So, that will be the part uh, we will be discussing under the second module of this course which will be on process control. So, thank you.